So good morning, everybody. Before we get into today's subject, let's talk about upcoming shows. On Tuesday, April 14th, that is this coming Tuesday, I will be doing a class on dinosaur adaptations. All of these classes are at 10 o'clock, the same time as this one. Dinosaur adaptations. In this class, I'll be talking about how animals change and how they adapt. So, for instance, how some developed weapons and some developed ways to figure out how to get around them, how they develop to eat different foods. I will be incorporating modern animals to talk about adaptations. Friday, April 17th, rocks and minerals class. In this class, I'm going to teach you about the various kind of rocks and minerals, and then I am going to do a video of, um, of me breaking geodes so you can see what they are like, and that's going to be a lot of fun. Tuesday, April 21st, ancient sea creatures, and then and that one we're going to talk about things like megalodon, mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, dunkleosteus, trilobites, we're going to be talking about some of the different animals that lived in the ocean. And then on Friday, April 24th, it is Dragons, Legends, and Myths. On uh, that particular show, I'm going to be talking about some of the fossils and how I think they fit into some legends. Were the legends created because people saw fossils and didn't know what they were? I don't know. We're going to talk about that. Dragons, Legends, and Myths is going to be the one. And then I have to do this. Um we still have 15% off of all the merchandise on our mer on our website, in our gift shop. It's dinosaurgeorge.com. That sale is good through May the 31st. There's free shippings on any orders of $25 or more. And unfortunately, we only ship in the U.S. I am so sorry because so many of you from Canada and from all over the world have inquired. But unfortunately, we just don't. And so uh, to get your 15% off, you would type in the code word Dino George. Now, take a deep breath, ladies and gentlemen, because it is time to talk about Tyrannosaurus Rex, the king of all dinosaurs. So be, the best way to start with Tyrannosaurus Rex is we need to talk about its name. The name Tyrannosaurus Rex, its name is actually made up of three Latin words. Tyranno, Saurus, and Rex. The name Tyranno in Latin means tyrant. A tyrant is a ruler who is very cruel, very mean. So a tyrant, there could be like a king, but then there could be a king who is a tyrant. Those are two different kinds of kings. A tyrant is somebody who is very, very mean. Now, Saurus means reptile or lizard. It's okay to say tyrant lizard king or tyrant reptile king. Keep in mind that when paleontologists first found dinosaurs, they recognized that uh, dinosaurs were, they thought they were giant lizards, but we learned, later found out they're not really giant lizards, but they're still reptiles. So tyrant, reptile, and then the word rex means king. So the name Tyrannosaurus Rex means tyrant reptile king or tyrant lizard king. That's why he's called the king of the dinosaurs. People always ask me, well, there's more meat eaters that have been discovered that are bigger. Why is he still the king? He will always be the king of the dinosaurs because that's what its name means in English. Tyrant lizard king. Something else I want you to realize about our friend Tyrannosaurus Rex. Do you notice in the spelling... The word Rex is not capitalized. In science, all animals have a first and last name. Tyrannosaurus is its first name. Rex is its last name. In science, you always capitalize the first letter of the first name, but not the letters in its last name. So when you see Tyrannosaurus Rex, you will always see the T is capitalized, uppercase, big, le big letter, and Rex is lowercase. And for you really young people, because I know this can be confusing to you, some books, some TV shows, some pictures call it T-Rex. T-Rex and Tyrannosaurus Rex are the exact same animal. T-Rex is its nickname. Tyrannosaurus Rex is its real name. So when you see T-Rex, remember, that just means Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's shorter to say T-Rex. I bet some of you have nicknames that are not the same as your name. 
People call me Dinosaur George, but some people call me DG. DG is the nickname, and it's shorter, and it's easier to spell. And I think I'm going to start calling myself DG because it's easier for me to remember those letters. What do you think of that? <laughs> so when you see the name Tyrannosaurus Rex, I want you to remember that the T will be capitalized and the word Rex is his last name and it will be lowercase. And do you know that Tyrannosaurus Rex is the most recognized scientific name in the world? Everywhere in the world... More people recognize Tyrannosaurus rex than any other word. And that includes an animal called Homo sapien. You and I are Homo sapiens. That's our scientific name, Homo sapien. Your dog's scientific name is Canis familiaris. How cool is that? Yes, I know your dog has a name that you call him at home, but his scientific name is Canis familiaris. And so, Tyrannosaurus rex's name, it is the most recognized name in the world. So where did this animal live? Now, during the late Cretaceous period, that's when Tyrannosaurus rex was alive. Tyrannosaurus rex lived about 65 to 66 million years ago. All of its earlier cousins were much smaller. T-Rex is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Or Tyrannosaurs, the family, were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Tyrannosaurus rex is the biggest of them all. Well, do you notice that during its time period... Most of North America is under the ocean or split by an ocean that went right through the middle. That is why Tyrannosaurus rex bones are only found on the western side of the United States. Because when it was alive, oceans separated it. That's why we don't find Tyrannosaurus rex in places like New York, where my friend Eric Matthew lives. We don't find, dinos we don't find Tyrannosaurus rex there because by the time Tyrannosaurus rex appeared, the ocean separated those areas. Tyrannosaurus rex is found from Canada all the way down, we think, all the way down into Mexico. There is some evidence that we find them here in Texas as well. So this is where Tyrannosaurus rex lived, and that's why he's only found in those areas. So if you live someplace other than the areas I showed you, then you may not ever be able to find a T-Rex because he wasn't living there at that particular time. So how big is Tyrannosaurus rex? Well, we cannot say for certain how big it is for a number of reasons. The most important reason being that when, they, when we find the bones, we don't know how much cartilage was in between each vertebra. Let me explain what that means. Cartilage is what the end of your nose is made of. It's what your ears. By the way, I'm done with these. Cartilage is what the end of your nose is made of and what your ears are made of. That's cartilage. Well, in between the backbones, the bones can't touch together because they would grind. They have to have something in between. That little rubbery stuff, we have it in between our backbones. We have it between our bones. It's cartilage. So when those bones are together, how much cartilage is there? Was there a little bit? Was there a lot? Well, if there was a lot in between each bones, then we would have to add all that cartilage to every single vertebra. And when we talk about the vertebra, look at how many vertebra there are. So if we added one inch for every vertebra, that might make our estimate a foot longer than somebody else's estimate. So the estimates for Tyrannosaurus rex are it was between 40 to 45 feet long, it was between 12 to 18 feet tall, and it probably weighed about 15,000 pounds. Just so you know, an elephant usually weighs about 6,000 pounds. So Tyrannosaurus rex weighed 15,000, elephants weigh six. So let's take a look at all these bones and let's talk about what they did. First of all, we'll focus on the tail. The tail was used for two things, for balance and as a weapon. Here's balance. Have you ever gone to the park and you saw one of those seesaws? We call them teeter-totters. You know what I'm talking about? Like one person sits on one end and one person sits on the other and you go up and down like this. Okay, that's the way T-Rex's body is. It's kind of like a seesaw. His head is on one end, his tail is on the other. 
He has to be balanced. If his head weighs too much, if his tail weighs too much, you do not want to walk around with your head on the ground, right? So that tail is used as a way to balance his body. Second of all, it is a weapon. He could swing that tail with tremendous force and knock down something he wants to eat, or he could use it to fight against a rival. We find a lot of tail bones that have broken and healed injuries. Do you guys remember the forensic class where I showed you broken bones and how they healed together? Well, we find broken bones on T-Rexes all over because they lived a very tough life. There was no doctor to go to. So T-Rex was a very uh, confrontational dinosaur. From the tail, we move to the hips. Do any of you remember the two groups, two family groups separated by their hips? Do you remember what those two were? One was called Sorisian. One was called Ornithischian. Do you remember that? I taught that to you when we talked about dinosaur families. Which group does Tyrannosaurus Rex belong to? Can anybody remember? Is it Sorisian or Ornithischian? Yes, it is Sorisian. Sorisian is the hip. So we see those big hip bones and that big bone pointing down, hanging underneath them. That is called the pubis bone. And that is a bone that we think might have even been able to lean or sit on it when it was resting. That'd be kind of cool. And then let's go into the legs. Now, I am going to share with you one of the coolest things about the legs, especially about the foot. When a big animal stomps or walks on the ground, it makes something called an earth tremor, shakes, the ground vibrates. Scientists believe that Tyrannosaurus rex could hear through its feet. It could hear through its feet. Now, that doesn't mean it listened to, no to sound through its feet. It picked up vibrations in its feet. And the vibrations would go up the foot. It pads on his foot, up in his ankle, up to its knee, up to its hips, and down its backbone and into its inner ear. How nuts is that? That means that even if its prey is walking silently... It's still making vibrations on the ground, and we believe Tyrannosaurus rex may have been able to hear them. Now, how could we possibly know such a thing? It all has to do with work of scientists like, for instance, Professor Larry Whitmer from Ohio University, who does CAT scans of dinosaur skulls and can see inside. And this is what the brain of a Tyrannosaurus rex looks like, and that pink thing is its actual inner ear they can actually see the inner ear canals. And that, by comparing that ear canal to that of a modern crocodile, which is a cousin of Tyrannosaurus rex, we know that crocodiles can hear low frequency sound and vibrations. Do you know, you ever see those pictures of those crocodiles that are all uh, waiting for the zebra and the wildebeest to cross the flooded river so they can grab a snack? Well, they know those animals are coming long before they get there because they can pick up the vibrations in the ground. So it is possible that Tyrannosaurus rex could hear inside of its inner ear canal, it could hear the vibrations of any other dinosaur in the area. That's absolutely crazy. That's nuts. Now, by the way, here is a mold of the skull of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Isn't that crazy? I'm holding the brain of a T-Rex. That's kind of nuts, isn't it? It's about as big as my hand. You know, every time I hear somebody say a dinosaur's brain is the size of a walnut, I'm like, no, it's not. That's just a phrase somebody used. That's not how big. Stegosaurus's brain is even bigger than a walnut. It's about the size of two walnuts. So that's the brain of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now, how did we get this? Well, I didn't reach in his head and pull it out. Trust me. No, the way we got that is, remember I said that people like Dr. Whitmer were doing scans? Well, his scan can produce a 3D image, and then from that, he is able to use a 3D printer to make the copy of the brain. And that's how I was holding it. Let's continue on with the skeleton. Notice its back and the big ribs. 
Well, of course, those ribs are used to protect its internal organs, its heart, its lungs, its stomach, its kidneys, all of the same kind of things that you and I have inside are the same things Tyrannosaurus Rex has inside. So it, it protected, the ribs protected its internal organs. And now let's get to those arms, those silly little arms. Everybody makes fun of Tyrannosaurus Rex's little hands. Well, here's why he had them. Let's go back to our seesaw. Remember our teeter-totter? Remember our seesaw I talked about? And I said his head is on one end and his tail is on the other, and he has to be balanced. Well, because his head was so big, and I keep saying his, I don't mean to exclude the girl T-Rexes. In fact, we think girl T-Rexes were bigger than boy T-Rexes. Boo! What a rip-off! Boys, we've been ripped off! Those naughty girls. So anyway, when I say him, I'm just referring to T-Rex. I, I should say it. Okay, so our seer, teeter-totter, right? Head on one end, tail on the back. Its head is gigantic, way big. And because its head is so big, remember what I said about being balanced? Well, if it had great big giant arms hanging down, then that would mean that he would be unbalanced. He would be leaning forward. So its arms got smaller as its head got bigger. And that's because Tyrannosaurus Rex is something we call a head hunting dinosaur. Not that he hunted somebody else's head, but Tyrannosaurus Rex used his head to catch his food. He chased his food. He didn't grab it with his hands. He grabbed it with his mouth. Now you might think, well, that's going to be hard to catch. But let me ask you this. Do snakes catch their food with their mouth? Do sharks catch their food with their, I mean, do snakes catch their food with their hands? No. Do sharks catch their food with their fins? No. Do wolves catch their food with their front paws? No. They catch their food with their mouth. And Tyrannosaurus Rex is a perfect example of one of those dinosaurs who uses just his head. So that is why his hands are little. He doesn't need them. And speaking of that head, let's get into it. The best part of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. The best part of waking up is T-Rex in your cup. I better get paid by the Folgers Company for giving them a plug. This is what a baby Tyrannosaurus Rex would have looked like. Now, let me tell you something about the skull. The skull is separated into two major pieces. The skull is the upper part, and the lower jaw is called the mandible. This is not a skull. This is a skull and mandible. Yes, when we see it, we call it a skull. But I want you kids to remember there are two parts to it, two major parts. The skull is the upper part. The mandible is the lower part. So here's a trick you can play on your parents. Show them a picture of a T-Rex head and say, what do you see there? And your parents will say a skull. And you'll go, uh, no. That is a skull and mandible. Thank you very much. They are two pieces, but those two pieces are broken down into even more pieces and parts. Each piece of the skull of a Tyrannosaurus Rex has a name. The lower part where the teeth are. Now, the, the whole lower jaw is called what? The mandible. But the mandible is broken into pieces. The part that has the teeth is called the dentary. The dentary is the lower part where the teeth are located. Let me see if I can show you a picture. Let's go back to this guy again. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. This whole thing is called the, the mandible. But this part, see where that crack is right there? That crack right there, this part is called what? What did we call it? The dentary. The upper part that has the teeth, that's this part up here, that is the maxilla. Want to see how big a T-Rex's maxilla is? Are you sure? Give myself a little room. Here, ladies and gentlemen, is the maxilla of an adult Tyrannosaurus Rex. This is the maxilla 
of an adult Tyrannosaurus Rex. Look at the chompers on that baby. Okay, you see the hole I'm looking through? Can you see that? Let's use our baby. The hole I just showed you, that hole right there. Baby, grown up. Baby's head can fit in that hole. So remember, when you look at the skull of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you are not looking at one thing. And oh, by the way, let me give a plug. Uh, Scott Hartman is a paleontologist and an artist from Wyoming. And he was kind enough to let me use this image that he created. So I want to give him a shout out and tell him how much I appreciate him doing that. It's very kind of him to do that. So the, um, the pieces that you see are all parts of the skull. And there's two last things I want to focus on. Look at its eye. You see that round ring right there on its eye? That is called the sclerotic ring. You rarely see that in the skulls in museums. But his eye would have been right here. And there would have been a little circle of bones called the sclerotic ring that held the eyeball in place. When the dinosaur dies, let's go back and look at it again. When the dinosaur dies, those bones are so thin and tiny, most of them don't fossilize very well. So these dinosaurs had a ring of bone within their, uh, within their eye socket to be, able to, hold the, uh, to be able to hold the eye. And the most thing that most people recognize the minute you look is this big hole right here. What is this big hole? That is called the antorbital fenestra big word. Here's what I think it did. I think it did two things. If this was solid bone, if this was filled in with bone, that would make his head weigh more. What happens if his head weighs too much? You know. So that made the skull lighter. He didn't want to carry around a heavy head. But the other thing I think it did is remember I showed you how little the brain of a grown-up was? One of the biggest things animals have to worry about is getting their brain too hot. Heat stroke, what we talk about when you're playing in the summertime and it's very hot. Heat stroke is what we worry about. Heat stroke is not your body getting hot. It's getting your brain too hot. So I think this allowed heat in the head to have a place to escape so that the head didn't stay as hot. That's what I believe the antorbital fenestra is. The hole for the eye is always the second hole from the back. The weird shaped hole that almost kind of looks like uh, like a letter E, the black one right there by the squamosal, that is where a muscle attacks. That's not its ear, this bone. This bone is called, uh, this, this hole right here is where muscles connected that went down to its lower jaw. But that's not its ear. Its ear would have been back here in the back. It would have been a slit. So those are the parts and pieces of the skull. I know you're going to want to look at them more closely, but uh, you can come back and watch this video again and freeze that frame if you want to write down the names. Now, Tyrannosaurus Rex is completely different from all other carnivores for one main reason, and that is the shape of its skull. On the right side is Tyrannosaurus Rex's skull. On the left side is Allosaurus's skull. Notice how narrow Allosaurus's skull is from the back of the skull all the way to the tip of the nose. It's kind of shaped sort of like the letter V. But notice how wide Tyrannosaurus rex's skull is in the back. Here is why T-Rex's skull. Here's another image of our baby from the top down. See, most dinosaur skulls are not this wide. Why was its skull so much wider than others? Here's why. If Allosaurus were looking straight at you, his eyesight would not be looking straight ahead. His eyesight would be looking a little bit out to this side. So if I was an Allosaurus and I was looking at the camera, I would do this. I would do this. I would do this. I would do this. Because if I look like this, I'm looking over here. I'm looking at this thing and I'm looking over there at a puppet of all things because that's what's sitting over there. You guys want to see a puppet? 
This is a puppet somebody made of me and used in a show. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dinosaur George. Isn't that crazy? Um, it sits on my desk right by my microphone. So, <laughs> um, if I were an Allosaurus, I would be looking at my sign and I'd be looking over there. If I was looking at you, the Tyrannosaurus Rex changes all of that. The reason why his head is so wide and then gets so skinny is because its eyes were able to see straight down its nose. When Tyrannosaurus Rex is looking at you, he is looking right at you. He doesn't have to turn his head. He doesn't have to move his head from side to side. He doesn't have to do this. He just does that. When he is looking at you, he is looking right at you. That's what makes T-Rex such an amazing predator, is he could judge distance and depth, and that means that he is a hunter, not a scavenger. There's all kinds of books that talk about Tyrannosaurus Rex being a scavenger. That's completely, in my opinion, inaccurate because no science protects that. No, no science approves that. Why would a dinosaur who developed a head that gives him forward-facing vision... Be an animal that eats things that are already dead. He doesn't have to chase you. He doesn't have to see you. He doesn't have to chase after you. He's already, you're already dead. And the other reason why is because of his teeth. Let's bring back the big one. Anybody remember the scientific name of this piece? Do you notice? See, his nose would be up here in the front. Do you notice that all of his teeth are curved backwards? Backwards pointing teeth are designed for one thing, and that is holding you so you cannot get away. Look, if I put my finger in his mouth, it would go in easily. Would it come out very easily? No, my finger would not come out. My finger, my finger will not, my finger will not go. Hang on. Hang on. Wait for it. Ah. Okay. My finger didn't come out very easily. Because the teeth are designed to hold you. And its teeth are the number one thing that makes Tyrannosaurus Rex such a monster. And here's why. His teeth are huge and they have something on the side called a serration. Serrations are like sharp little hooks that cut through the meat. When you see the tooth of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and that's the tooth of a Tyrannosaurus Rex... They have the little edge. You can't see it very well here. Oh, maybe you can. There's a little line that runs right here, and there's a little line that runs right there. That is a serration. This picture gives a much better image of it. That's the same thing you find on a, uh, on a steak knife. The reason why your parents never let you use a steak knife by yourself if you're little is because the possibility of being cut by it. It's very, very sharp. So this dinosaur's tooth is its main weapon. But here is the other thing about its tooth that makes it very, very dangerous. Remember I showed you those tiny little bumpy ridges along there? Well, those little ridges have a tiny little hole in them. And when they bite into meat, the little ridges trap and hold little drops of meat and blood. That means their teeth are covered with rotting meat and blood. Gives them two things. Gives them cavities, gives them bad breath. But it doesn't matter to T-Rex because they lose and regrow their teeth like a shark over and over and over. Let's get our piece again. Let's get our axilla. Look, notice how the teeth are all different sizes. Baby tooth growing in. Let me show you the backside. Maybe it makes more sense this way. Okay, look. Just like a shark, this tooth fell out and the baby tooth is growing back. This tooth was getting ready to fall out. And if you could see inside the bone, you would see another baby tooth inside of there. When you look at the tooth of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, all you see is the part sticking out. But you don't see the root that goes way up inside of there. So this is the tooth with the root. That's why when somebody says their teeth are the size of a banana, but you look in the mouth and you go, that's not a banana. No, but if you include the root, it is. So its teeth have little pieces of dried meat and blood on them. 
but he wants them to have dried meat and blood because he also has something growing on his teeth that is called bacteria. And that means it bites you and it infects the wound with the bacteria that covers its teeth. Komodo dragons can do the same thing. They have something called a septic bite. That means that when you are bitten by a Komodo dragon, or if you were ever bitten by a Tyrannosaurus Rex, it's not just the bite that causes danger, but it's the bacteria, the infection. When you get a cut on your hand, your mom and dad tell you to wash it and keep it clean. Why? Because they don't want the bacteria to grow. That's why we wash our hands. The reason why we wash our hands all the time is not just viruses. They're different from bacteria, but it's also bacteria. And the reason why you brush your teeth at night is to get rid of that bacteria. But because Tyrannosaurus Rex grew new teeth over and over and over, it didn't have to brush its teeth because by the time its tooth rotted, it fell out and a new one came back anyway. And then also, um, it ate the dentist. So, that, <laughs> that is Tyrannosaurus Rex. Hey, something else I wanted to mention. When we talked about the arms, I, wanna, I want you to remember something. When you look at the arms of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, just so that you know how big the arms really are, ask your mom to put her arm out to the side. And no matter how tall or short your mom is, ask her just to stick her arm straight out, just stick your arm straight out like that, mom. That is about how long the, the arm of a T-Rex is from the tip of your mom's finger to her, to her shoulder. That's how long the tooth was, about that size. Your mom's might be a little bit shorter, a little bit longer, but that's close. So if you want to see how big the arms of a T-Rex are, tell your mom to put her arms out to the side and you can look at how long their arms would be. You can also ask your dad to do that, but if you do, ask your dad to close his eyes first and then when he's standing there with his eyes closed with his arms out, sneak around behind him, take his wallet out of his back pocket and run because you're rich, baby. You got the money and that's the power in your family. So, do not steal your dad's wallet. All right, <laughs> so those teeth with the septic bite, that tail with a deadly weapon, the feet that are able to pick up vibrations in the ground, eyesight that can look straight ahead, all of those things combined make it a very dangerous dinosaur. So the question is, then why was he there? Well, Tyrannosaurus Rex plays a very important role, and that means he helps to maintain the balance of nature. Seesaw. Nature, plants on one end, animals on the other. They have to be balanced. If too many plant eaters show up, not enough plant eaters, meat eaters have to keep the numbers down. They're actually very important. When a Tyrannosaurus Rex attacks something, it doesn't just run in and attack everything. It's using its eyes to pick out which one of those animals I want to attack. Because what he's looking for is he's looking for a baby that's gotten away from the family. It's looking for uh, one that is walking with a limp. Or he's looking for one that's very old or one that's walking with its head down because it's sick. Those animals are easier to catch. T-Rex is not going to attack a full-grown, healthy Triceratops because that dinosaur can fight back and you don't want to get injured. But if you see a Triceratops and he's in a group... And when you walk out and all of them run, but one of them is very, very slow, that means that that one's probably sick. And that's going to be the one that or Tyrannosaurus Rex is going to attack. Well, let's imagine for a moment that we have a group of plant-eating dinosaurs, duckbills. One of them has the flu. <laughs> He's sick. He has the flu, okay? All right. When T-Rex shows up and the herd spots him, they're going to run away. Which one is going to be the one that's not able to run with the rest of the group? It's going to be the one that's sick, right? So that's the one T-Rex is going to eat. Well, you might think, well, if he eats him and he's sick, though, won't he get sick? No, the answer is no. Because like vultures, their stomach acid can kill all the bacteria and diseases and viruses that it eats. So that's the one T-Rex is going to kill. Now, it's a shame that he had to kill something. And all of his family members are going to miss him. But why is it good that T-Rex killed that one. You know why? Because that one was sick and he could have gotten all the other ones sick. 
Now, humans, we don't have to do that, right? Because we can have medicines, we can take care of ourselves, and we can take care of our pets, too. But in nature, it takes an animal like Tyrannosaurus Rex, the... Um, he is going to help the other dinosaurs. He's actually good and beneficial. So let's finish by talking about who exactly he ate. Tyrannosaurus Rex lived at a time when dinosaurs like Ankylosaurus, the duckbill dinosaurs, and the horn dinosaurs existed. Even though Tyrannosaurus Rex is huge, even though he's powerful, he's got excellent eyesight and all those other weapons, he also needs to be careful about who he attacks. You cannot just rush up to a healthy Ankylosaurus because the Ankylosaurus could turn sideways and hit you with that club. And by the way, do you notice in this picture? Let's do this. Let's bring him down here. Do you notice in this picture that if that club from that Ankylosaurus hit that Tyrannosaurus Rex anywhere in the legs, Tyrannosaurus Lex Rex's leg would be destroyed. It would be broken, and he wouldn't survive. Triceratops, if he ran those horns into you, he's going to hit T-Rex right about there in his center part of his stomach. That's going to mean that Tyrannosaurus Rex is going to have internal injuries. He's not going to just run in and attack. He's going to be very, very careful. Duckbills, in my opinion, would have been its main prey. Duckbills would have been the animals who I think Tyrannosaurus Rex would have attacked because they didn't have the same weapons that the other ones that lived in his environment did. They probably could outrun T-Rex, but in a long distance run. In a short race, the 50 yard dash, I think T-Rex would have been faster, but T-Rex probably runs out of energy pretty quick because he's so big. Duckbills could run much longer. So as long as the duckbills saw him coming and they had enough advance, they could take off running. And therefore, the only one he's going to catch is one that's hurt or sick or injured or old. And so duckbills, their defense would have been when they were eating, they never all looked in the same direction. One face this way, one face this way, one face that way, one face that way. That's to make sure that they see what's going on around them. So I believe Tyrannosaurus Rex's number one prey would have been duckbill dinosaurs because they would have been less likely to attack or hurt him. But if he was hungry enough and if it needed to, then I do believe that it is going to attack animals like the horned dinosaurs and it's going to attack the ankylosaurs. And maybe what it would hope to do with either one of them is just bite it once and then stand back and follow it for a couple of days while the bacteria that was on its teeth are now inside of that animal. So that's how I think. I think T-Rex hunted different ways. Duckbills, I think they came running in with their mouth open and would hit the duckbill like a freight train and try to knock it down. And then when it knocked it down, it would use its big foot to step on it and hold it down while it leaned down with that big, gigantic head and took pieces out of it. That's duckbill hunting. Triceratops and other horned dinosaur hunting, maybe they hunted together in a family group because maybe Tyrannosaurus rexes lived in family groups. They may have hunted with their kids or a mate. We don't know that for sure. That's very hard to tell. Fossils tell us a lot, but they don't tell us all of the stories. So we don't know whether or not T-Rexes lived in family groups, but if they did, then the way they would hunt, if they were hunting a Triceratops or a horned dinosaur would be, one stands in the front, so Triceratops is looking at him, horns of a Triceratops. Our T-Rex is here, our Triceratops is here. T-Rex is going to keep him occupied to make sure the horns are pointing. Now, when you look at our friend Triceratops, notice the back. Do you notice that the back side of Triceratops is, um, is different? Let's flip him around. Oops, hang on, I flipped the wrong guy. Let's flip him around real quick and hang on. Okay, now, if this Triceratops is busy watching out for a T-Rex in the front, his back is completely unprotected. That's where T-Rex is going to attack. So if they hunted in family groups, I think one would stay in the front to keep him busy while bigger ones sneak around behind him. That's one way they could hunt. The other way would be just rush in and attack. 
with an ankylosaurus. I think the only thing ankylosaurus they could do with him is maybe hope to bite him on the front leg where they're away from that big tail and maybe give it an infection and hope that the infection causes them to die. Maybe it doesn't. Doesn't always mean being bitten doesn't mean you're a certain death. And let's finish this with this, because this class has gone on a little long, but everybody loves T-Rex. Was Tyrannosaurus Rex feathered? Was his skin smooth like that of a lizard? Was his skin bumpy like the legs of a turtle? Was its body completely covered in big, heavy feathers? Or was its body covered with just a few feathers? All of the evidence right now points to meat-eating dinosaurs, theropods, had feathers. They're finding it in so many smaller uh, meat eaters. So, because they all came from the same family tree, and because birds are descendants of dinosaurs and they have feathers, then it's reasonable to think that Tyrannosaurus rex had feathers. How many? We don't know. My guess would be that if it did have feathers, it would probably, as a matter of fact, you know what? Let me find one more picture of a Tyrannosaurus Rex that I think would be more accurate. Hang on just a second. Let me find one more picture that was accurate. And let's take a look at this T-Rex, wherever I have him, if I, in fact, I have him. I thought I did. Ah, maybe I don't have him anymore. Oh, what a bummer. Ah, I got rid of my other T-Rex picture. Well, that stinks. Okay. Um, uh, well, while I'm clicking on it, might as well find another guy, right? Here's another one with a mom and a baby. Um, I don't know whether or not T-Rexes had feathers all over their body. I don't think they did because they're so big, I think they would be too hot. I do believe that if they had feathers, I think they had them on their arms because they could use their arms. You know how birds will flutter their bright colored arms to draw attention to themselves? They'll flap and kind of move their arms. That might be what the feathers on the T-Rex is for. Maybe they were very bright. And when he didn't want the predator, the prey to see him, maybe he kept his little arms close to his chest so you didn't know they were there. But when he saw a girl, woohoo, ladies, look at me, ooh la la. So maybe they use them to signal. Maybe he had feathers on the, on the tail, on the end of his tail. He could swing them around. Have you ever seen an animal called a uh, peacock that opens up a big fan? Well, I don't think they had that. But I do think that if they had feathers, they may have had feathers there as a way to signal. But where I do not think they had feathers was the end of the nose. And did you notice on these images... I can't believe I got rid of them all. Did you notice on those images that... They did not have feathers on the nose, and there wouldn't be feathers there because it's sticking its nose into its prey to eat it. And that means blood and meat and goo would be on the nose. If it had feathers, that, those feathers would be covered in goo. So that, my friends, is a class on Tyrannosaurus Rex. I hope that you all enjoyed the class. I hope you learned something new. And I hope T-Rex is your favorite dinosaur. So here is your project for today, if you want. I would like for you to, to post any picture you have of a toy T-Rex or a T-Rex picture you drew or a T-Rex costume. Anything you have, if you have T-Rex teeth, anything you have. I would like for you to post those pictures on the Dinosaur George Jr. page. We love looking at your pictures. Love them. So many of you have been posting pictures of your collections and, and your favorite drawings. So your project today is post any picture of anything to do with T-Rex. It can be a picture out of a book. It can be a picture you found online. But that's your project for today is post a picture of anything to do with Tyrannosaurus Rex. And finally, and finally. One of the last things about T-Rex, did T-Rexes attack and eat other T-Rexes? You remember the class we had in forensics where I showed you the back of the skull and I showed you that hole in the top of the head. If you don't remember that, find it. It's on the Dinosaur George page. It's called Forensic Fossils. Watch that class. In Forensic Fossils, that class gave you some hints as to what kind of animal made that hole in the back of that T-Rex's skull. 
The answer is another Tyrannosaurus Rex. T-Rexes attacked and killed other T-Rexes, probably to fight over territory or for a mate or to protect their food or protect their young. T-Rexes killed other T-Rexes and they ate the other T-Rex. So the only thing Tyrannosaurus Rex feared was a bigger T-Rex. Thank you all. Class is dismissed. I will now hang around and answer some questions.